Okay, hi, I'm Cody. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology from UE Bristol, and I'm going to be talking to you today about employability and distrust, specifically focusing on hiring those with prior sexual offence, because that's one of my main research areas. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover some of the empirical research that we've got. Um, I'm going to focus on employability barriers, distrust, and some of the future research directions. So first of all, why this topic? Um, why am I presenting this instead of some lie detection tools or techniques that I normally do? From the reducing recidivism perspective, employability is really important. So if you're a psychologist, you might be interested in the criminogenic needs side of things. So employment reduces the risk of reoffending. If you're a criminologist, you might be more interested in the desistance side of things. Again, employment is key for um, abstaining from crime. Now, relating to lies and allies, distrust is a really important part of understanding lie detection. So that's why I focused on this. Specifically, thinking about the individual differences that people might have and our own biases towards that. I'm also hoping that what we can do is have some opportunities for collaboration. Uh, right now in the field of uh, sexual offending and employability and uni lie detection researchers, so it would be great to bring some more people into that. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is an important topic, uh, but if I haven't, a little bit more about the desistance side of things. So according to the desistance literature, employment's really important because it makes people want to avoid reoffending, right? And part of this is because it creates social ties, it gives people opportunities to change, it gives them social networks, um, and it essentially acts as a protective factor. So what we know from the research is that employment reduces reoffending following a prison sentence, and that happens regardless of the crime. But we know that people who have prior offence struggle to find and maintain employment, and that's emphasised when there's a sexual um, when there's a sexual offence um, in particular. So as we go through this, I've put some quotes on the slides. I won't read those out, but that's just to give you an idea of some of the data and some of the research that we're finding. So I'm not going to talk about one specific study. Instead, I'm going to talk about the research a little bit more generally. Okay, so employment's really important, we know that. One of the approaches it's designed to increase employability is through the Bad of Box initiative. And this is essentially a campaign that's designed to increase opportunities for people with a prior conviction. Now, according to Bad of Box, what should happen is because the tick box element of the application forms is removed and people have made a conscious decision about what candidate to hire, when they're later told about a prior offense, they shouldn't reject the person in theory. Now, when I first heard about this campaign, I thought it was really interesting. It was really fascinating. Um, it started off as an American initiative. It's now based here in the UK, and there's over 130 employers that are signed up to it. However, the lie detection researcher me wasn't quite convinced by this, and I was a little bit worried about the trust side of things. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to empirically test this by focusing on whether or not a DBS check, a disbarring and disclosure service check, leads to rejection rates. According to Ban the Box, this shouldn't change. So initially, we set up two different experiments. What we did is um, we got participants to select a candidate. So we gave them an application form, we gave them a CV and some interview notes, and we asked them to decide which candidate they wanted based upon this. Most people chose the same candidate. We asked them to disclose why they chose the, the candidate, so to give us some qualitative measures. We asked them to rate how trustworthy, how valuable, and how suitable for the job a person was. For the purpose of this talk, I'm only going to focus on the trust side of things. We then went back and we said, OK, here's a DBS check. And we either revealed no prior conviction, just to ensure that the experiment was working correctly, or one of three different sexual offending conditions. So either a disclosure of rape, sexual activity with a child, or possession of indecent images of children. After the DBS check, we asked people to rate the uh, candidate again on how trustworthy, how valuable, and how suitable for the role they were. And we gave them the opportunity to change the candidate they wanted to select. We asked them to explain why they uh, made that decision. Okay, so in the initial hiring decisions phase, as expected, people made decisions based upon the qualifications, the prior experience, how prepared the candidate was in the interview, and things like desirable characteristics, you know, if the person presented well, if they seemed enthusiastic about the job. 
And what we found um, with the initial decision makers, so we done a thematic analysis based upon this, and we found the same thing across a multitude of studies. People pick the best candidate for the role. When we then refilled the DBS check and we asked them to provide their ratings again, and we asked them to think about why they made that decision and to tell us why, we start to see changes um, in people's uh, responses. So first of all, after the DBS check, people viewed the candidates to be less trustworthy if there was a prior sexual offence. So in the no previous conviction condition, there was no difference, as we would expect. In the rape, sexual activity of a child and possession of indecent images of children, people were significantly viewed as less trustworthy. Now, in theory, this shouldn't have happened. According to the box, this certainly shouldn't have happened, but it did. So we asked people to think about why this was the case. And one of the themes that we found in the data was a lack of trust towards a candidate. People didn't feel like they could trust someone if they had a prior sexual offence. And we've run this a number of times um, across different studies, looking at different manipulations, and we're always finding lack of trust to be one of the key things that emerges. In terms of rejection rates, we asked people if they wanted to keep the candidate or if they wanted to reject them. So we gave them two options. And what we found is that in the majority of cases, they wanted to reject in um, the public facing role. So people were either asked to pick a candidate for a job that was involved in a public facing role, like working in a petrol station or working as a shopkeeper. And we also ran this in a non-public facing role. So in things like factory work, uh, where they're not coming into contact with members of the public. And that seemed to have a little bit of an effect, particularly where there was a contact offence. Okay, so the other thing that we noticed with the data is that disclosure seems to play a big part in trust. So actually, according to Ban the Box, this shouldn't happen. What we think is happening is that Ban the Box is actually more harmful if there's a prior sexual offence. So this works really well if people have a conviction like robbery, um, drug misuse, or something less violent. However, on sexual offences, it appears to be quite detrimental. Now, we've run this experiment in, enough, in a number of different settings. We have looked at violent offences, we've looked at drug offences, um, and we found that disclosure seems to be another thing that people are uncomfortable with. So this is the idea that they don't trust the person because the person hasn't disclosed the offence themselves, right? Instead, the DBS has been provided, and so that appears to be having an impact. So what we wanted to do there is we wanted to examine whether or not a self-disclosure would start to increase that trust side of things. Okay, so thinking a little bit more about some of the findings, and I appreciate I'm chucking a lot of data and a lot of research at you, um, but just to give you some context, lack of uh, prior disclosure came out in five of our studies originally. We wanted to focus on this. We wanted to see if we did a self-disclosure at the CV stage, if that would have an impact. So against the theory completely, um, but that's where our research is going now. What we found was that when people provided a self-disclosure, actually they appeared a little bit more trustworthy. So what you can see here in the top is when the, there was no self-disclosure. So similarly to the first and second study, um, the rejection rates were quite high. When there was a self-disclosure in the CV, so that's where the person had wrote a statement such as, I have a prior offence for either rape, sexual activity of a child, or possession of indecent images of children. They then explained, but I want to lead a healthy life. And then they went into their CV. So that sentence was the only thing that changed. And it was enough to reduce rejection rates across all different experimental conditions. So that appears to be something that's quite useful. We've still got the data. We haven't completely analysed it but we have started to look at some of the qualitative responses from it. And it does suggest that actually a self-disclosure might be an impact in hiring decisions and it might start to improve trust. This is especially uh, useful in the cases of uh, child-based sexual offences. So that's something that we're examining next. Okay, I appreciate I've thrown lots of information at you, but just to give you an idea of some of the research that we're focusing on over the next academic year, for those of you who are interested, we're going to examine stranger versus known victims to see the impact of distrust there. We're going to look at historical versus recent crimes because a couple of the prison services that we work with uh, think that this is going to drive distrust and this is going to have an impact on hiring decisions. 
Uh, one of the local persons that we're working with is interested in gender impacts because there's more female um, sexual based offenders now than there have been historically. We're going to examine things like IQ and disability to see if that has an impact. Um, and we're open to collaborations and look forward to being able to hopefully bring in more lie detection people. At the minute, the only measure for distrust that we have is a seven point Likert scale, asking people how trustworthy the candidate is before and after this disclosure. Okay, thank you all for listening. Um, I'm gonna stop because I think we're doing questions at the end. <laughs>